Hi everyone, welcome back to this magnificent event of medical education where we will integrate everything today. And in this session, we will now deal with cardiac sciences, cardiology. This session will be led by Dr. Arvind Kumar, who will look at the medical aspect of the cardiac disease, which is massive. We will also look at ECG. We have Dr. Sanjeev to show you what is going on at the pathology level, Dr. Anupma to show you the physiology level, Dr. Thiru to show you the drugs and all those beautiful slides telling you how those drugs act and I'll show you a bit of role of radiology in this cardiac event. We will try our best to give you an integrated unified picture of cardiac diseases. I think you know I'm sure you're already enjoying the event and I'm sure after this event you will be wiser, smarter and you'll be able to do better as a doctor, better as a medical student, better as an exam goer. You will improve. I hand over to Dr. Arvind to start the discussion for the day. Yeah, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this uh, cardiac sciences or cardiovascular system, we will do in the form of uh, clinical cases because this will be your uh, next pattern of uh, exams, any exams. So I will pick uh, 10 cases and in that 10 cases, we'll discuss how to make a clinical approach to diagnose a particular disease. Then we will do a little bit of uh, physiology, pathology, radiology, and the treatment aspect. So we will integrate it. So let's start with the uh, cases in cardiovascular system. All right. So clinical case one, 55 year old ma male presented with dyspnea on exertion, palpitations and angina symptoms, particularly at night time. On examination, bisphyrian's pulse was present and there was early diastolic murmur at left third intercostal area. What is your clinical diagnosis? So uh, let's see how to approach this topic of uh, valvular heart disease. So as a combined, it is a valvular heart disease. So how to go about the clinical approach? So most important is always the symptoms symptoms of any particular disease and we will pick particular symptom of a particular condition. So we will ask these questions ki why it is IOT regurgitation, what are the causes, what are the pressure volume curves, what are the pathologies of valvular heart disease, investigation and treatment. So let's start with why it is IOT regurgitation. That means the clinical approach. Symptom wise, if uh, we look at the symptoms of a particular uh, valvular heart disease, if symptom of uh, hemoptysis is given, symptom of hemoptysis is given, it will point towards, it will be pointing towards the mitral stenosis, MS. So one key symptom, hemoptysis, mitral stenosis. There is one important question. What is the most common source of bleeding in mitral stenosis? Remember, it will be a venous source and it is the bronchial vein which are more common as a source of hemoptysis. Then the symptom of uh, nighttime angina. This is a very peculiar symptom of aortic regurgitation. So in the clinical question, just mark nocturnal angina, it will be aortic regurgitation. While if a symptom of fatigue is given, that will be because of low cardiac output. And very interestingly, in mitral regurgitation, initial symptom is fatigue due to low cardiac output initially. While if the symptom of syncope is given, this will point towards the aortic stenosis. So this is how we'll make uh, the tentative diagnosis based on the symptoms with which patient is presenting with. So here in our clinical question, nocturnal angina is mentioned. So it points toward the aortic regurgitation. Now look at the clinical signs. So in the clinical sign, we have basic clinical signs of pulse and the murmur. So on the basis of these two simple uh, clinical signs, we can make a accurate diagnosis. So there are two important types of pulse. One is a bisphyrian pulse. Bisphyrian pulse basically is two peaks in systole. So uh, it can be a diagram based question also. In the bisphyrian's pulse, we will see two uh, peaks in the systole like this. So this is S1, this is S2. 
So uh, between S1 and S2, here is a systole. Two peaks are felt. This is Bisperian's pulse, and it is highly characteristic of severe aortic regurgitation. So in our clinical case, Bisperian's pulse was mentioned. So again, uh, it points towards the AR diagnosis. While the second characteristic pulse is a parvus at tardus. What does it mean? Parvus means a low amplitude. Low amplitude. At means late and tardus means peak. So there is a low amplitude and late peaking like this. There is a late peaking towards the S2 sound. Usually the peak occur in the mid systole, but it uh, is shifted and the amplitude is also low. It indicate that there is some uh, obstruction to the uh, ventricle outflow. So that will be more suggestive of aortic stenosis. So two important pulses, bisperians and parvus at tardus. Now coming to the uh, murmurs. So what are the types of different murmurs? We can classify these murmurs according to the timings. So murmur can be classified as a murmur of systole. That means it will be between S1 and S2 or it can be diastole between S2 and S1. Systolic murmur can be ejection systolic murmur. So ejection systolic murmur, if we look at the diagram of ejection systolic murmur, could be a diagram based question also. This is S1, this is S2. And here is the opening of semilunar valve somewhere here. So this you know in the physiology that between S1 and the opening of semilunar valve, it is a, a isovolumetric contraction. So here the ejection during the ejection phase turbulence is occurring. What is the meaning of ejection? Ejection means the blood is going from ventricle to the blood vessels. So there will be a turbulence after semilunar valve open and that turbulence will peak usually in the mid systole and then show a decreasing trend. So this is an ejection systolic murmur, crescendo, decrescendo murmur, also known as mid systolic murmur because the peak is in the mid systole. There are two important valvular diseases which can lead to ejection systolic murmur, aortic stenosis and pulmonary stenosis. That means stenosis of the semilunar valves. While second systolic murmur can be a pan systolic murmur and if we can understand with the help of a diagram, pan systolic, as the name suggests, full systole, the murmur will be heard, S1, S2 and this murmur start from S1 and ends till S2, like this. Almost a uniform murmur, almost a uniform murmur, and some books say hollow systolic murmur as well. Regarding the valvular heart disease, it will be the mitral regurgitation and tricuspid regurgitation. So how to remember this? Whatever is the left-sided valvular defect, same murmur will be produced by the right-sided valvular defect of that particular valve. While diastolic murmur can be early diastolic murmur, so if we make a diagram of early diastole, this is S2, this is S1. Here is the opening of AV valve. So this early diastolic murmur start with S2 and shows a decreasing trend like this, occupy the early part of the diastole, early diastolic murmur. Two reasons, only two reasons, regurgitation of semilunar wells like aortic regurgitation and pulmonary regurgitation and just for naming purposes aortic regurgitation murmur will be known as key hodgkin's murmur so this murmur primary murmur of ar will be known as key hodgkin's murmur and do not confuse it with the austin fleet murmur austin fleet murmur is not the primary murmur of ar it is due to the secondary effect it is due to the complication of ar so primary murmur early diastolic of ar is known as key hodgkins while the murmur of pulmonary regurgitation will be known as the graham steels murmur a very very popular question graham steels murmur pulmonary regurgitation. Now coming to the mid diastolic murmur. So mid diastolic murmur uh, occupy the mid diastole like this. This is the opening of the AV well and this is S1. So this is start after the opening of the uh, AV well shows a slight decreasing trend and just before systole increase in trend pre systolic accentuation. So this will be the morphology of a mid diastolic murmur. Two valvular defects will be there, mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis. So in our case, 
patient has got nocturnal angina symptom patient has bisphenyl pulse pulse examination and pulse uh, patient has the early diastolic murmur so all goes in favor of aortic regurgitation and area is also important the area of aortic regurgitation will be up area that is a third intercostal space on the left side just parasternal area will be the murmur area of aortic regurgitation so this uh, answer our first question ki why it is aortic regurgitation all of you must have said in the beginning that it is ar but why it is ar this is the approach how to make a clinical diagnosis of different valvular heart disorders now what are the causes of different valvular diseases so the causes can be given in the clinical history like a patient is a case of say rhd patient is elderly something like that they will be given so that will be additional clue in making a diagnosis so the causes of the uh, murmurs different types of valvular heart disease we can classify as a right sided lesion or a left sided lesion so starting with the first one right sided lesion tricuspid stenosis the most common cause is rhd indeed uh, hardly there is any other cause of tricuspid stenosis so rhd is responsible for maximum cases of ts for tricuspid regurgitation the most common cause is right ventricle dilatation so what happens when right ventricle dilate the tricuspid leaflet gets separated from each other so it is not the primary valvular lesion which is causing the tr it is the right ventricle dilatation and why right ventricle dilatation is occurring because of underlying cause for example core pulmonary or maybe pulmonary embolism they put a strain on the right ventricle and right ventricle can stretch or dilate leading to tr while pulmonary stenosis the most common cause are the congenital causes pulmonary regurgitation is because of the pressure of pulmonary artery pulmonary artery hypertension this is the most common cause mitral stenosis most common cause is rhd mr most common cause is rhd remember this is worldwide the most common cause of mr is rhd though in western population it is mitral valve prolapse so whenever question comes uh, assume it to be a world or assume it to be a indian cause so it will be rheumatic heart disease as the most common cause of mitral regurgitation while aortic stenosis is calcification which can be age related calcification or uh, for aortic regurgitation it is a age related degeneration of the valve that is the most common cause of the aortic regurgitation here one more important question come about the carcinoid syndrome so carcinoid produce serotonin and that serotonin affect the right sided valves because serotonin is almost degraded in the lung so it is not able to reach the left side so we see right sided murmur and most common murmur due to carcinoid syndrome is tricuspid regurgitation remember this the most common cardiovascular lesion due to carcinoid is tricuspid regurgitation this is a important question tricuspid regurgitation so these are the causes of different valvular disorders now the third question will be answered by uh, dr anukma the pressure volume curves of different valvular uh, lesions yeah dr anukma dr anukma you can unmute yourself uh, thank you so much thank you so much dr arvind and um, uh, i was also listening to you so carefully and, and there's so much to learn every time uh, you uh, you have you speak and so let me just um, same here ma'am i also get to learn from your physiology yes so this is a left ventricular pressure volume loops which are very commonly asked as far as um, uh, the central institute exams are concerned so let's revise them and we normally do it in class as well so uh, let's do this left ventricular uh, pressure volume loop okay um okay all right so now when you look at the left ventricular pressure volume loop what you have on the x axis is the left ventricular volume in milliliters and left ventricular pressure in millimeters of mercury is on the y axis so starting from point a now point a here is the end of diastole and you know already that the diastole is a period of filling so what do i expect the left ventricular volume here the left ventricular volume is close to 120 ml this is the maximum volume 
volume. It has been filled with blood during diastole. The volume is at 120 and the pressure is approximately between 5 and 10. Now, at this point, the moment the left ventricular pressure becomes higher than the left atrial pressure, there is a closure of the mitral valve. The mitral valve closes at this point, and this gives rise to the first heart sound. The mitral valve will close here and gives rise to the first heart sound. And closure of the mitral valve means onset of systole. Onset of systole, the first phase of systole, isovolumetric contraction phase. So A to B is isovolumetric contraction phase. What happens in our isovolumetric contraction? The, uh, the uh, mitral valve is closed. The aortic valve has not yet opened. Left ventricle is a closed chamber and it begins to contract. There is a rapid rise in pressure with no change in volume. This is your isovolumetric contraction phase, a rapid rise in pressure till the left ventricular pressure reaches 80. 80 millimeters of mercury is the diastolic pressure in the aorta. So as soon as the LV pressure exceeds the diastolic pressure in the aorta, there is now, it literally pushes the aortic valve open. So this is the point where the aortic valve opens at point B. Aortic valve opens here and opening will not produce a sound. So you do not hear any sound over here. Now, the moment the aortic valve opens, now starts the period of ejection blood will move from the left ventricle into the aorta and there are two phases of the uh, of the ejection phase there is a rapid ejection phase and there is a slow ejection phase rapid ejection phase there is a rapid rise in pressure in the left ventricle and also a rapid decrease in volume of the left ventricle please understand we are looking at the lv pressure volume changes so there is a decrease in the volume of the left ventricle what about the slow ejection phase? Though, of course, we cannot really uh, demarcate where is the uh, 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 where does the rapid ejection phase end and the slow ejection phase start because you do not have time here in the picture. But we do know that in the uh, slow ejection phase, there is the LV pressure begins to fall. Why does it begin to fall? Is because by this time now the LV is more or less empty. Most of the blood has gone into the aorta. Not completely empty, but relatively with less volume of blood. So the, the left ventricular pressure begins to fall. The left ventricular volume is decreasing as soon as the LV pressure becomes lower than the aortic pressure. Please understand the opening and closure of valves depends on the pressure difference of the two chambers. So as soon as the LV pressure becomes lower than the aortic pressure, the aortic valve closes. Aortic valve closes and this gives rise to the second heart sound which marks the end of systole. So starting from A, onset of systole, A to B isovolumetric contraction phase, B to C is the ejection phase. A to C is systole. S1 at A, S2 at C. Now at from, at, from C now starts the phase of diastole. The aortic valve is closed, mitral valve has not yet opened, left ventricle is a closed chamber, sharp fall in pressure with no change in volume. This is the isovolumetric relaxation phase. The moment the LV volume, the L, sorry, the LV pressure becomes lower than the LA pressure. The moment the LV pressure becomes lower than the LA pressure, the mitral valve will be forced open. So this is the point at point D, the mitral valve opens. Mitral valve opens, now starts a phase of filling. Blood from the left atrium will come into the left ventricle. There is going to be an increase in the LV volume with very little change in pressure. And the reason for why there is a little change in pressure is because of the fact that LV, the ventricles are compliant chambers. They tend to distend as they are being filled with blood. So there is very little change in the pressure. The moment, but the moment the LV pressure exceeds the LA pressure, mitral valve will close and the first heart sound and the next cardiac cycle starts. So once again, mitral valve closes at A, aortic valve opens at B, aortic valve closes at C and mitral valve opens at D. And there is a little mnemonic here for that. And I always want you to remember your physio ma'am. So ma'am Coco, yes. So at point A, mitral valve closes. At point B, aortic valve opens. At C, aortic valve closes. At D, mitral valve opens. But I always give you a little warning here. Please remember where is A, B, C, D. If you mix up that, 
then obviously this mnemonic will go for a toss. So um, you need to remember that. And remember A to B, isovolumetric contraction, B to C, ejection phase, C to D, isovolumetric relaxation, D to A is the period of filling. A to C is systole, C to A is diastole. Another very important information that you get from the left ventricular pressure volume loop is the width of the loop. The width of the loop coincides with stroke volume. The width of the loop gives you an idea about the stroke volume. What is stroke volume? End diastolic volume, end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume. This is stroke volume. There was, an, um, there was a question which was asked in AIMS where we were asked to calculate the ejection fraction from the left ventricular pressure volume loop. And what is the ejection fraction? Stroke volume, that is from the width of the loop divided by the end diastolic volume. In case you want it in a percentage, then multiply this by 100. This is your ejection fraction. You have got a question where you were asked to calculate the ejection fraction. Another uh, interesting, uh, another thing which you can, uh, another information that you can gather from this loop is the, uh, this loop will also give you an idea about the pulse pressure. The height, the maximum height here coincides with the systolic blood pressure and point B is the diastolic blood pressure. And what is systolic minus diastolic? This is the pulse pressure. So you can also get an idea about the pulse pressure from the LV pressure volume loop. Let's go on to um, uh, the slides, what happens in the case of different valvular lesions. Now, this is a very typical loop uh, that you see in, uh, this is a tall and a narrow loop. Number one, the moment you get a narrow loop means this is where the stroke volume is reduced. Stroke volume is reduced would be a stenotic lesion. So a tall and a narrow loop is typically seen in aortic stenosis. Why is it a tall loop? Because now the LV has to, the left ventricle has to exert more pressure to open a stenosed valve. So you get a tall and a narrow loop, right? So this is typically seen in aortic stenosis. Let's have a look at uh, another one. Now, this is again has been asked in, uh, in an AIMS exam. You were given an uh, image and you were asked to identify the valvular lesion. Now, this is a shift of the loop to the left. Shift of the loop to the left is characteristically seen. Again, it's a narrow loop. And whenever you have a narrow loop, that indicates a stenotic, stenotic lesion. Now, here is, there is, what has happened here is uh, the end diastolic, there is a decrease in the end diastolic volume here. This is, there is a shift of the loop to the left. This is, if the decrease in end diastolic volume means, now the LV is not getting completely filled with blood, mitral valve is therefore stenosed. This is typically seen in MS, a shift of the loop to the left. Let's have a look at another one. Now here is, a, here is a, a, a loop where you are seeing, it's a broad loop, stroke volume has increased. Stroke volume has increased, right? Now, stroke volume increases would mean a regurgitant lesion. A regurgitant lesion, now aort uh, the aortic regurgitation, MR, two of them we have to identify here. Now, the moment you see a wide loop like this, it's a regurgitant lesion, but the, the, the uh, one feature which, we will, which will help you to identify, look at the isovolumetric relaxation phase isovolumetric relaxation phase. Normally, this should be a straight line. There should be no change in volume of the left ventricle during isovolumetric relaxation phase. Now, what has happened here is, now in this case, this is typically seen in aortic regurgitation here. Let me try and see, try and explain you, explain why. Now, this point where the aortic valve closes, now obviously because it's an incompetent valve, it is not closing properly, blood regurgitates back into the left ventricle. So where I should have got a straight line, no change in volume of the left ventricle during isovolumetric relaxation, I see this line slanting towards the right side. There is an increase in the volume of the left ventricle during isovolumetric relaxation phase. It's a slant of the line to the right. 
of course, a huge increase in end diastolic volume. There is a large increase in stroke volume. All those are also pointing towards a regurgitant lesion. But what is actually one feature which should help you to distinguish between AR and MR? Isovolumetric relaxation phase. So let's see what is going to happen in the isovolumetric relaxation phase of MR. Of course, the moment you look at the loop, you know this is a massive increase in stroke volume. This is a regurgitant lesion. Now, um, uh, how do I say this is MR? Now, in the isovolumetric relaxation phase. Now, in AR, we saw that it was a slant to the right. But what do we see over here? Initially, in isovolumetric relaxation phase, there is a decrease in the LV volume followed by an increase. Why a decrease in LV volume during isovolumetric relaxation phase? Because now what has happened in MR is the mitral valve, which should have been closed, is incompetent. So what happens during isovolumetric relaxation is some blood regurgitates from the left ventricle into the left atrium. Please remember, movement of blood is always from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So even though the LV is in a state of relaxation, the pressures are higher than the LA pressures, which are extremely low. So pressure in the left ventricle is still higher than the LA pressure. So what happens is some blood regurgitates from the LV into the LA, producing an initial decrease in the LV volume. But as soon as the LA pressure becomes higher than the LV pressure, blood goes back into the left ventricle, followed by an increase in LV volume. So this is what this is the difference that you find in AR and MR. In AR, it was a slant to the right in isovolumetric relaxation phase, only an increase in LV volume during isovolumetric relaxation. But in MR, you find an initial decrease in the LV volume, followed by so initially the, sl the, the, the line slants towards the left, followed by an increase in LV volume and the line, the isovolumetric relaxation line slanting towards the right. Right? So just briefly, the look at this, the four loops, tall and narrow loop, aortic stenosis, shift of loop to left, mitral stenosis, isovolumetric relax, this is a regurgitant lesion, isovolumetric relax, relaxation, slant to the right, AR, initial decrease in LV volume, followed by an increase in LV volume during isovolumetric relaxation phase, MR. That is from my side, Dr. Arvind, please carry on. Thank you. Uh, fantastic, ma'am. <laughs> so it also opened my mind to uh, now correlate uh, the valvular disease with the physiology aspect. Uh, uh, very nice presentation, ma'am. So uh, coming to the uh, next uh, discussion of uh, valvular heart disease, uh, it will be uh, the important uh, pathologies of uh, uh, valvular heart diseases. So, uh, Dr. Sanjeev. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Arvind. Uh, and uh, it was so nice uh, to listen to Anupama ma'am's uh, the pressure volume curves. I hope I had a physiology teacher in my college like uh, you. Uh, yeah, so uh, about uh, the current case uh, was a aortic regurgitation. The current case was the aortic regurgitation and actually in regurgitations in pathology we will not see much so basically i am showing you a few gross images of the uh, valvular diseases which are important for your exams so first is you know i am talking about uh, aortic valvular stenosis which is a calcific stenosis so what is happening in calcific stenosis the one very important thing cusps are involved in this so there is calcification happening in the cusps very very important to note there will be no commissural fusion that is happening. So look at this, the commissures are, so I'm marking here, they are free, they are not fused, and there is formation of calcification. I hope all of these, the black arrows that I have pointed out, these are the calcified areas. And there can be metaplastic bone formation that can be seen in uh, the, that can be seen in the calcific aortic valvular stenosis. Similarly, there is one more that will be the mitral annular calcification the name itself is suggesting the calcification is not happening right in the cusps 
So cusps are not involved here. Cusps are not involved here. There'll be calcification of the annulus that is there. Now look at this. This is your cusps that we are talking here. The calcification is not near the cusp. It is at the periphery where there is an annulus. No commissural fusion, obviously, because there is nothing near the commissures. In contrast, so very important, if they give you an exam, they can give you either a calcific aortic valvular stenosis uh, or one more will be a rheumatic stenosis. Rheumatic aortic stenosis, look at this, this is a rheumatic aortic stenosis, which will show commissural fusion. This is because primarily there's a lot of inflammation happening and there'll be fibrosis happening. That is why, look at the commissures, they are fused here. Commissural fusion has happened and that is what is your, how to differentiate between the rheumatic stenosis and the aortic, uh, the calcified aortic stenosis. So these were the only three important slides that would have come from, uh, you know, basically expected from the valvular heart diseases. Uh, now I'll hand it over back to Dr. Irvin, sir, and uh, we'll be coming back again for different diseases subsequently. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjeev. It was a nice presentation for these uh, valvular heart disease and how to make a differential diagnosis, whether it is calcific or a rheumatic origin. Uh, now, uh, next uh, in our uh, 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 list of uh, discussing the valvular heart disease uh, will be the uh, investigations. And in the investigation uh, will be the uh, chest X-ray and the ECG. And I think the chest X-ray will be, uh, which is asked is of uh, mitral stenosis mainly. So I will uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Sumer for X-ray of uh, mitral stenosis and then I will take over the ECGs in different valvular heart diseases. Thank you, Dr. Arvind. I think you, uh, all of you have discussed this wonderfully. And in radiology, I think the only important X-ray in rheumatic heart disease is mitral valvular disease. And only three things to see here are, number one, the predominant wall that is involved is mitral wall. So when the mitral wall is involved, the, all the X-ray features will be because of left atrial enlargement. The X-ray features are because of left atrial enlargement. So earliest feature will be the this bulge in the left auricle. This is what is your third Mughal sign or straightening of the heart, left heart border. This is your left auricular bulge. Second thing is because left atrium is related to the carina. So the carinal angle will become widened. So you can see in this x-ray itself, you can see the carinal angle is widened and the left main bronchus is lifted up. Third thing to remember here is that in normally in the car, chest x-ray, the right cardiac border is formed by the right atrium. But I'm sure all the children today are able to appreciate in this x-ray, you can see a double atrial shadow. This is original shadows because of the right atrium. Now you can even see the left atrial shadow. So this is actually, if you can imagine, this is your enlarged left atrium actually. Okay. So this is your enlarged left atrium, which is causing a bulge in the which is causing a bulge in the left heart border, which is auricular bulge. It is causing carinal widening. You can see a double atrial shadow. And in earlier days, if you do a barium swallow, you would see a posterior displacement of the esophagus because of LA enlargement. So I think these are the most important things. And it is one of the most important questions in your exam to see as an X-ray. So I'll hand back to Dr. Arvind to take it forward. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sumer. Uh, so now uh, we will uh, discuss uh, the ECG finding of uh, uh, different uh, valvular heart disorders. All right. So ECG findings. Uh, ECG finding, we should know the uh, basis of uh, pressure changes or basis of uh, the chambers which are affected in a particular valvular heart disease. Uh, uh, starting with the mitral stenosis, in the mitral stenosis, if we we'll, uh, understand with the help of uh, four chambers of the heart, these are the four chambers of the heart. Uh, here is left ventricle, left atria, right ventricle, and right atria. Now the uh, mitral stenosis is starting from here. So obviously the first chamber to get enlarged or to have a high pressure will be left atria. So the sequence of the changes will be left atrial enlargement. This will be the first change in the ECG. And how we look for the left atrial enlargement, it will be lead V1. So in the lead V1, we will focus. 
and we will get to see this is the p wave just before the qrs this is the p wave and very well you can appreciate that the negative component of p wave is quite enlarged usually the uh, positive and negative component they are equal they are equal but here the negative component is quite prominent this is suggestive of left atrial enlargement and negative component prominence in lead v1 important question is also known as morris index positive morris index positive after the left atrial enlargement the pressure will go to the pulmonary uh, vessels pulmonary hypertension will be there and uh, then there will be right ventricle hypertrophy so the next uh, chamber to get affected is right ventricle and we will see the right ventricle hypertrophy now v1 is the right sided lead so any right ventricle pathology we will focus on the right sided lead that is v1 and uh, right ventricle is represented by the qrs so there will be the qrs voltage will be increased in v1 remember normally qrs is predominantly negative in v1 here it is predominantly positive representing the right ventricle hypertrophy so this sign is obvious in the v1 lead that if rvh the r wave in v1 will be more than 7 mm or we can say prominent r wave in v1 that is a sign of the right ventricle hypertrophy and looking at the four chamber diagram again after the right ventricle hypertrophy pressure will go to the right atria and then right atria will also enlarge this is a very very characteristic feature of mitral stenosis that we get to see by atrial enlargement not only in the chest x ray but also in the ecg and how to look for the by atrial enlargement in the lead to height of p wave is less than 2.5 mm that is a normal height but here you can see the p wave height is increased p wave height is increased so when p wave height is more than 2.5 mm it is suggestive of right atrial enlargement so this is a very uh, good ecg to uh, understand all the changes of mitral stenosis so three chambers are affected and left ventricle is spared in cases of uh, mitral stenosis while looking at the other ecgs of uh, valvular heart disease Uh, like this ecg again uh, my advice is uh, when you are uh, getting a question on the ecg always read the clinical history first make your own clinical diagnosis make your differential diagnosis then look for the options ki what are the options given to you and then go to the ecg what mistake students do that they start with the ecg and then they get confused ki all the 12 years they have to study so first clinical history make your own diagnosis then go for the options what are the options given then go for a particular lead suppose if uh, the clinical history is suggestive of mitral regurgitation so in the mitral regurgitation the uh, problem is the blood is going from left ventricle to the left atria regurgitation so what it will do it will cause a left atrial enlargement as well as blood will come back again to the left ventricle it causes this the ventricle volume overload left ventricle hypertrophy so the two signs we, which we can see in mr is left atrial enlargement and left ventricle hypertrophy for left atrial enlargement we will focus on v1 ecg lead and for lvh we will focus on the uh, v5 or v6 ecg leads so here we will get to see the ecg changes of lvh in this ecg clearly and those changes are increase in the height of r wave in the left sided leads uh, that is the v5 so if the r wave is more than 25 mm either in v5 or v6 this is suggestive of left ventricle hypertrophy so this is suggestive of left ventricle hypertrophy now uh, there is a concept of uh, a volume overload hypertrophy or a pressure overload hypertrophy so in a volume overload hypertrophy like regurgitant lesions there will be no change in the st and t wave st will be normal t wave will be upright no changes 
ST and T will be normal. So when in the ECG, ST and T are normal along with LVH. So this LVH is due to volume overload condition. Volume overload condition. While if there is a ST segment depression and T wave inversion along with LVH, so it indicate a pressure overload condition pressure overload condition like uh, aortic stenosis they causes the uh, ischemia like changes like strain pattern changes of st depression and t wave inversion this is how to make the diagnosis on the basis of the ecg while uh, if we look at this ecg in this ecg uh, we can clear cut see that in the left sided leads uh, v5 v6 or v4 there is st depression t wave inversion st depression t wave inversion so this will be more suggestive of some aortic stenosis condition so this is known as the strain pattern seen in cases of the hypertrophy due to pressure overload so this is how to make the diagnosis now coming to the uh, protocol of uh, different uh, valvular heart diseases uh, you will get the protocol for the severe valvular heart disease and then to the left sided lesions because left sided lesions causes hemodynamic instability or they uh, cause more symptoms as compared with the right sided lesions so uh, this is a flow chart approach to the treatment now if you look at the mitral valve uh, lesions severe ms and mr now what is the meaning of severe ms and mr it is based on echocardiography severe ms is the mitral valve area of less than 1.5 cm square while severe mr is the regurgitant jet going into the left atria more than 60 ml per beat this is a severe mr then we will assess for nyh symptoms of breathlessness if they are more than equal to 2 if the symptoms are yes more than equal to 2 dyspnea on normal activity we go for the surgery while if the dyspnea on exertion is nyha grade 1 then we look for the complication and the most important complication of ms and mr is atrial fibrillation very important after atrial fibrillation patient deteriorate very fast so if atrial fibrillation is present in spite of nyha1 surgery will be recommended if atrial fibrillation is absent then we will go for a conservative treatment now what is the surgery of choice in cases of ms surgery of choice is the balloon valvotomy for mr surgery of choice is replacement valve replacement or repair while in cases of severe as severe as is aortic valve area less than 1 cm square while severe ar is the regurgitant jet going into the uh, left ventricle from the aorta regurgitant fraction of blood 60 ml per beat that is severe ar and these are diagnosed on the echocardiography we will go for a nyha uh, same staging more than two patient is symptomatic yes go for surgery if nyha1 then we look for the ejection fraction if ejection fraction is less than 50 percent then we go for the surgery it indicate a left ventricle dysfunction while ejection fraction is more than 50 percent then we go for a conservative treatment so this is all about the uh, uh, treatment approach in a simplified form for different valvular lesions so with this we finish with our clinical case one that is the valvular heart disorders now coming to the next clinical case and next clinical case is case number two so case number two uh, 21 year uh, old patient presented to the emergency with high grade fever inflammation of knee and ankle joints which is fleeting in nature fleeting in nature means migratory so that is a clue migratory arthritis of multiple joints there is a history of occasional palpitations there is a history of preceding episode of sore throat the ecg shows a prolongation of pr interval 
So with this clinical clues, we can easily make a diagnosis of or uh, rheumatic fever. So this is very simple clinical case. This is a diagnosis of a, a rheumatic fever. So the most likely diagnosis is a rheumatic fever. So what are the questions that we need to answer? What is the pathogenesis of acute rheumatic fever? What are the microscopic and macroscopic features? And what are the treatment guidelines for a rheumatic fever? So now I will hand over uh, the to the uh, to Dr. Sanjeev for this uh, pathogenesis feature. They are very important. They are very important. Yeah. So this case was a uh, acute <clears throat> rheumatic fever. So many people have this confusion that be between two things. What is that? Uh, what is a rheumatic fever and what is a rheumatic heart disease? Remember, acute rheumatic fever is an acute manifestation which will have fever and arthritis, etc. And when this keeps recurring, there will be damage to the heart happening and that the sequel of acute rheumatic fever will be called as a rheumatic heart diseases, which will be a valvular heart disease mostly. So let us first start talking about pathogenesis. In simple words, if I want to explain the pathogenesis of acute rheumatic fever, it is nothing but a type 2 hypersensitivity, we call it. So what is this type 2 hypersensitivity? What happens? Usually there is an infection by <clears throat> beta hemolytic streptococcus. So patient has a sore throat that was given the history. So whenever everybody has a sore throat, you mount an immune response to this organism. Whenever you mount the immune response to the organism, everybody of us would have had sore throat, but everybody of us did not develop rheumatic. That is because in few people, what happens is there is an antigen from the heart. We call it as the M protein or the M antigen. This mimics your streptococcal antigen. And once it mimics your streptococcal antigen, the antibodies which are directed against the streptococcus, of course, they will kill the streptococcus. They will also start killing your antigens in the heart. So basically the cells of the heart start dying. That is the primary one. Apart from that, there can be other small organs also affected. But the most important one is the heart which will be affected. So which will ultimately lead to vegetations. I'll show them subsequently and they can lead to a shock body which is very pathognomonic in case of a rheumatic and also they can cause the pancarditis. So including your pericarditis and of course there can be a pancarditis. So this fibrinous pericarditis sometimes we end up calling it blood and butter pericarditis as well. So let us talk about the gross feature that we see. So now when I'm talking about rheumatic vegetation, the moment I'm seeing vegetations, I'm not talking in an acute, acute condition, it's not acute rheumatic fever, this will be a rheumatic heart disease because there will be a constant damage that will be happening to the valve and this will ultimately lead to formation of these vegetations. So what is the description of this vegetation? Look at this, this is the valve in a zoomed version of the valve here and I hope all of you are able to see this is the leaflet and this will be your the surface of the valve and this is the edge of the valve where they are going to be there. Now look at this. What is this? These are showing irregular white, wart like. So this is what we say small warty vegetations along the lines of the closure. So I cannot see that because the other cusp of the valve is not seen in this image. This will be the line of the closure of the valve. So this is what you are seeing in case of a rheumatic. This is what is in rheumatic heart disease. It's not a rheumatic fever, right? So now if I look at the vegetations, what will be there under them? So if I look at microscopy, the characteristic finding on microscopy is what we call it as a Eschoff's nodule. So what are Eschoff's nodule? Eschoff's nodule are, these are like granulomas. Basically they are like, they are not granulomas by the way, but these are an immune mediated response that damage is happening to the myocardium or the endocardium. It can occur in any of the layers of the heart. So Eschoff nodule typically consists of, this was a question in the uh, uh, previous year, Eschoff nodule contains all except, look at this, lymphocytes will be there, plasma cells will be there, macrophages will be there. So T lymphocytes will be there, there will be plasma cells, there will be plump macrophages. These macrophages, we call them Anishka cells. They look like caterpillar. Look at the nucleus, the nucleus will appear like a caterpillar. That's why they are called as a caterpillar cells. These are the Anishka cells. So Eschoff nodule, part of it is Anishka cell. Of course, out of this T lymphocyte plasma cell, which is the best thing to be seen in Eschoff nodule will be your <coughs> the Anishka cell or also called as caterpillar cell. And then you can also see fibrinoid necrosis. If you remember fibrinoid necrosis, fibrin like material deposition usually happens whenever there is a immune mediated, especially type two and a type three hypersensitivity mediated damage 
to the vessels we were talking, not only vessels, even also the endocardium. So fibrinoid necrosis will be seen if the S-shaft nodule is on the endocardial, because I told you this can be anywhere, they can be within the myocardium, they can be in the pericardium, they can be even in the endocardium. So in endocardium, you will end up seeing additional fibrinoid necrosis. So uh, I will hand it over back to uh, Dr. Irwin now. So he'll uh, get back into the this one. Uh, so this was about the rheumatic heart disease. Basically, these were all from the rheumatic heart disease. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjeev, for such in enlightening uh, pathological features of uh, rheumatic fever. A uh, very, very important topic. Uh, now, uh, we'll discuss the treatment aspect of uh, the uh, rheumatic fever. In the uh, rheumatic fever uh, uh, for treatment, yeah, so treatment can be for the acute manifestations and as well as for prophylaxis. So if a patient is presenting with the main symptoms of arthritis, so we give aspirin in the anti-inflammatory dose and there is a very good response to the aspirin and there is a rule which says that if arthritis symptoms are not decreasing within 24 hours of aspirin, then it will not be a rheumatic fever. This is such a rule, so such a good response with aspirin. While if carditis is present, that usually leads to heart failure. We give supportive treatment like diuretics. We can also give steroid. This is one of the indication of giving steroid in a refractory carditis in cases of rheumatic fever. Uh, last option in carditis is the surgery. That is a valve replacement. So that is done if patient is not responding to supportive management, patient is not responding to the steroid therapy, then the last option is the valve replacement that can save patient life. While if the patient have a chorea manifestation, in that case, usually the chorea feature uh, decreasing during the uh, night time uh, and during the rest conditions. So sedation is given. Anti-epileptics like uh, Velcroit uh, can be given. And in refractory cases of chorea, this question came two years back in the uh, exams. Refractory chorea, Sidenham's chorea, we can give IVIG as the last resort therapy. Now for the uh, prophylaxis, uh, indeed, uh, prophylaxis is a more uh, frequently asked question for rheumatic fever. It can be a primary prophylaxis. Rem uh, understand the meaning of a primary prophylaxis. Primary pro prophylaxis means a patient has got a, a streptococcus pharyngitis episode. We have to prevent the development of acute rheumatic fever. This is the meaning of a primary prophylaxis. And we have to give antibiotic within nine days of the symptom onset. Within nine days, it will work. So we will give a single dose, single dose of benzathine penicillin. Benzathine penicillin. Single dose for a primary prophylaxis. If patient is allergic to penicillin, then we can give azithromycin. While the secondary prophylaxis is patient has already been diagnosed with acute rheumatic fever, we have to prevent the recurrent attack, repeat episode of uh, uh, rheumatic fever, because more the number of episodes of rheumatic fever, more will be the chances of a rheumatic heart disease with subsequent complications. So uh, there can be uh, three scenarios in which patient can come to us uh, of rheumatic fever. There is no carditis. In that case, the duration, uh, the antibiotic of choice again is the same, that is benzathine penicillin. Frequency is three to four weekly. In India, we apply a three weekly course of uh, prophylaxis and the duration is five years or till patient age is 21 years, whichever is longer, whichever is longer. For example, if an 11 year old uh, uh, child comes to us and we have to give the uh, prophylaxis, no carditis. So we will give the prophylaxis till patient achieves the age of 21 years. That means total 10 years duration, total 10 years duration. Other way around, if patient comes at the age of 18 years, so we will give the patient till 23 years. That means five years, whichever is longer, whichever is longer. While for carditis, the duration is 10 years or till patient age is 21 years of age. 
there is some controversy about the age in the carditis. So this is according to the Harrison reference that they gave 21 years for the carditis, whichever is longer, 10 years or till patient achieves the age of 21 years. While if patient has already a case of rheumatic heart disease, in that scenario, we will give for 10 years or till patient achieves the age of 40 years, whichever is longer. But in India, we follow it should be given lifelong prophylaxis. So these are the important questions on the prophylaxis of rheumatic fever. So this was our uh, case number uh, two about the acute rheumatic fever. Now we come to the uh, case number three for cardiovascular system. Uh, case is a 30 year old man, uh, known case uh, presented with uh, three weeks history of fever and palpitations, the known case of rheumatic heart disease. Today, he presented with sudden onset, left-sided weakness of left upper and lower limbs. So from the clinical history, you can identify that there is a past history of rheumatic heart disease and there is a history of fever. So remember, whenever rheumatic heart disease, a known case presented with fever, always suspect the complication of infective endocarditis. Other features with which patient is uh, presenting with is the uh, hemiplegia or a stroke, stroke episode. So stroke is a common complication which occur in patients of infective endocarditis due to embolization. embolization. On examination, fingertips tenderness is present. Now you can very well identify what is this fingertips tenderness. Yes, you can give answer. This fingertips tenderness is nothing but the Osler nodes. Osler node is also the uh, manifestation of infective endocarditis. With splenomegaly, echocardiography shows a new regurgitant uh, mitral regurgitation murmur. What is the meaning of a new regurgitant mitral regurgitation? That means this uh, MR was not present in earlier echocardiography. It uh, is a new lesion. It is a new lesion along with the episode of fever. What is the most likely cause of this presentation? So this presentation is going in favor of infective endocarditis. So let's see, uh, uh, these Duke's criteria for infective endocarditis, are they getting fulfilled or not? So Duke's criteria, we can classify into two groups. There are two major criteria and five minor criteria. Two major criteria is uh, evidence of infection, evidence of infection. So it can be either a blood culture or a serological diagnosis. Serological diagnosis is for coxilla, that is a Q fever. Echocardiography suggestive of endocarditis. This is a second major criteria. And endocarditis, it can be a vegetation, which we can see on the echocardiography. It can be a new regurgitant lesion, which can be seen, or it can be intracardiac abscess. These are the features on the echocardiography as a major criteria. While for the minor criteria, uh, number one is a predisposing factor. And uh, here is also uh, some controversy on online sources and uh, our textbook reference. So the most common predisposing factor for infective endocarditis overall worldwide is rheumatic heart disease. That is the most common predisposing. And in the rheumatic heart disease, the most common valvular lesion which predispose to infective endocarditis is mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation. While non-cardiovascular uh, cause is intravenous drug abuse. Intravenous drug abuse. These are the predisposing factors given in the history. Uh, fever, uh, it is the uh, one of the uh, uh, most common symptoms seen in patients of uh, uh, infective endocarditis. Immune phenomena can be there. Immune phenomena like uh, uh, pneumonic is rogue. Rogue mean uh, disease, uh, raw spot, rheumatoid arthritis factor positive, Osler node, and glomerulonephritis. While vascular events are usually the uh, stroke episodes or the hemorrhages or petechiae, these are the vascular events or mycotic aneurysms. While number five is blood culture positive, not satisfying the major criteria. So let's see definitive diagnosis of infective endocarditis, how it is made. So for definitive diagnosis of infective endocarditis, we need two major criteria or one major criteria plus three minor. 
or all five minor criteria so let's see in our clinical case uh, is the diagnosis a definitive diagnosis of infective endocarditis is made or not answer patient is a case of rheumatic heart disease so one minor criteria then patient has fever second minor criteria patient has on the echocardiography a new regurgitant lesion on examination there is osler node so one two three three minor criteria are satisfied and one major criteria echocardiographic finding of new regurgitant lesion so that means patient is having a definitive diagnosis of infective endocarditis so this is how we approach the clinical case and my advice is two or three days before you should go through the duke's criteria because clinical questions come from the duke's criteria for infective endocarditis a very very important topic for infective endocarditis now uh, so question we have answered uh, this is a case of infective endocarditis reason is duke's criteria now what are the causes of infective endocarditis and what are the pathologies of different types of uh, infective endocarditis i will hand over to uh, dr sanjeev thank you sir thank you uh, very much uh, <clears throat> yeah so uh, all of you saw this was a case of infective endocarditis there and uh, we will now first discuss the pathogenesis of this condition once we discuss the pathogenesis uh, you know then it becomes very easy for us to understand and you know so, uh, all the uh, your duke's criteria looking at this once we understand the pathogenesis then automatically your duke's criteria also becomes very very useful for you to understand so let me start with the pathogenesis of infective endocarditis so basically understand this there has to be infection happening inside the heart so first thing we need to know how should the bacteria enter there and then next we should also know how is it different from sepsis sepsis is nothing but infection in the blood but it is happening in the heart here so let us talk about this so one important thing there has to be a turbulent blood flow that is happening in the heart and if you just remember go back to your duke's criteria sir was telling that one of the minor criteria was you know the precipitating risk factor like a rheumatic disease can be any of them whichever is causing a turbulent blood flow any valvular disease which can cause turbulent blood flow in the heart is one the initiating point so whenever there is a turbulent blood flow what happen now this turbulent blood flow will lead to endocardial damage in the valves so when the endocardium gets damaged normally what happens any cell gets damaged you can regenerate yes you can regenerate but however whenever there is a damage to endocardium or endothelium you always start the process of regeneration or healing first and that will be by formation of a clot so there will be a thrombus formation there or a fibrin clot will be formed along the valve this will be very small clot which will be formed along the valves not very much alarming whenever there is a damage there has to be stoppage of you know seepage of the blood down into that's why we are forming this now once there is a thrombus formed if you all know the fibrin clot will be a mesh like structure so further two possible things will be there one if there is a bacteria in the blood that's what i call it bacteremia if there is no bacteremia there is a thrombus formed already on the valve there is no bacteremia then what will happen then this will lead to something called as a non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis we call it as short form nbpe non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis is simple there is a thrombus formation because of a turbulent blood flow inside the heart and that is what is nbpe non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis sir what if there was a bacteremia present so if there was bacteremia that means i am now talking bacteria is inside the patient's blood and now this patient's blood is having bacteria which will be circulating in his blood which will also reach the heart by the way now if it reaches the heart then what these bacteria get trapped in these thrombi the thrombi that are formed along the valves remember but bacteria will be trapped along the in the thigh along the valve and once the bacteria get trapped there is a ideal temperature for bacteria to proliferate the best temperature will be there you know core body temperature and also they will be having a lot of nutrients so these bacteria will start proliferating once the bacteria start proliferating now what will happen any time you have a bacteria which is proliferating in your body what will happen you will start mounting an inflammatory and immune response so two possible things one before that so these bacteria can undergo a septic embolization and this is what sir was also talking about so osler node jane lesion rot spot different things which will be there these 
the uh, the vegetation itself because the vegetation which will be a thrombus and also bacteria can get what embolized even it can cause stroke also basically there can be embolization this can cause an abscess anywhere or a stroke or any infarct can happen that is one thing second is because there are bacteria the patient's body will mount an inflammatory response to the bacteria so when you mount an inflammation of course you will be mounting an acute inflammation that's why we call it as a endocarditis now so whenever there is an acute inflammatory response, this inflammation will start now destroying the valve. So basically the valve destruction is happening by the inflammation secondary to a bacteria which is stabbed in the thrombus. So now very important if you look at this for infective endocarditis to happen, two important things are required for us. One, there should be a turbulent blood flow. Second, there should be a bacteremia happening. Turbulent blood flow can because of multiple reasons, one important cause is a rheumatic heart disease, valvular heart diseases. Other than that, you know, any stenotic diseases can cause, even hypertension can be causing, other diseases can be uh, causing turbulent blood flow. Now, next question always comes, sir, how will bacteria gain access into the blood? So there are two impart, okay, before that bacteria gaining access into the blood. One more thing I just want to tell you here is, see now look what has happened is bacteria has trapped inside the vessel. You already have mounted an inflammatory response. You also will mount the immune response. There might be antibodies produced against the bacteria. Yes. And once they are produced against the bacteria, they can form, they can go and bind it to the bacteria. And commonly if it is a streptococcus, then what they can bind and form an immune complex. And this immune complex can lead to glomerulonephritis so, and other immune complex this is basically there can be an immune complex formed inside your heart so very very important is sometimes as sir was telling instead of history of rheumatic or any other thing or acute fever patient might end up presenting with glomerulonephritis straight away and this is very important especially whenever you have a patient with a psgn like manifestation no antecedental sore throat history always keep looking for one of your suspicious diagnosis should be a precipitating infective endocarditis which might be leading to this such type of glomerulonephritis i'll explain you subsequently based on the causes why glomerulonephritis will be there also now bacteremia why does bacteremia so this can be a source i already explained to you why does bacteremia happen bacteremia can commonly come from one cause could be a streptococcus streptococcus viridians which is a normal commensal in the oral cavity sir it is in the oral cavity how does it go into the blood it doesn't go into the blood on its own because so when does it go into the blood very commonly whenever you try to do some procedures in the oral cavity common history they will be giving you either he went underwent an extraction or he underwent a root canal treatment and he was not especially not given antibiotics after that so these streptococcus viridians can enter into the blood from there and then they can be bacteremia happening so that is one so this will be the dental procedures and one more thing would be a staphylococcus aureus staph aureus is a commensal in the skin so from the skin how does it enter into the blood this will enter into the blood if there is unhygienic practices of the injections that will be done and that will not be done by doctors most of the times it will be done by IV drug abusers. So IV drug abusers do not sterilize every time so you know one person to another person they keep exchanging this so streptococcus gains entry into the blood. So just because the bacteria enters into the blood it will cause septicemia but not a uh, uh, infective endocarditis. So for that turbulent blood flow is also important to have a infective endocarditis. So now let us talk about the causes or the <clears throat> pathologically we divide them into an acute and a subacute. Of course this is clinical part also by the way subacute means clinically will not have frank manifestations like fever. So subacute is caused by low virulence organism because it is caused by low virulence organism the organisms your immune system will also not be very strong. Your inflammation also will not be very strong. That's why fever, etc., will be less. Whereas acute is caused by more virulent organisms, the acute infective endocarditis. Most common cause for acute infective endocarditis is Staphylococcus aureus. That's the most common cause overall for acute infective endocarditis I'm talking. Whereas subacute, so obviously this, uh, this Staph aureus is coming from where? This is coming from the skin we discussed already. For subacute, the most common cause is the streptococcus viridians. And where is this coming from? Oral cavity. So this is coming from oral cavity. Just to know this one point here, 
overall which is the most common cause so this is one people keep asking me overall most common type is the sub acute infective endocarditis so if they do not specify you acute or sub acute if they just mention infective endocarditis you will end up answering streptococcus viridiens as the most common if they specify you acute then you will be writing as a staph aureus usually infective acute infective endocarditis will have the strong manifestation like fever chills and other inflammatory manifestation usually fever chills will be absent in your sub acute why because viral organism is low virulence your inflammation response will not be much so organism can proliferate but very slowly that is the reason why the sub acute are the one which will more commonly present with glomerulonephritis and if you remember psgn post streptococcal glomerulonephritis this is your streptococcus which is infecting your heart here and that is what is leading to this so uh, usually valvular damage will be less severe as compared to acute that is expected because the valvular damage is happening primarily because of the inflammatory destruction of your uh, by the body right so this is about the acute and the subacute so in this just to remember what are the causative organism overall most co com common cause will be the streptococcus viridiens most common for acute infective endocarditis will be the streptococcus or uh, staphylococcus aureus now so let me show you the pathological features of the infective endocarditis what do we see in these pathological features here so look at this what am i seeing i hope all of you are able to see grossly identify the arrow mark that i have drawn from this i can identify anything about this these are your <clears throat> the cardiac tendine that will be there or the papillary muscles will be there here and the above thing is your valve now what am i looking at this look at this the circle that i have drawn now in this circle what i'm seeing there's a hole created here and there is some yellowish structure that is seen this is possibly a purulent material that is there so what has happened is the valve has been already damaged by the organism and this will be on this is on another view on the right hand side look at this what i am seeing here of course i am able to see these are the chordate tendine that means this is beneath the valve and most possibly this was your valve here this is a longitudinal section by the way and look at the vegetations i told you vegetation will be containing what here thrombus will be there and also bacteria will be there because the thrombus is there it will appear hemorrhagic look at the identification features of infective endocarditis this can come as a gross image hemorrhagic vegetations of the heart are important topic for all the uh, exams that you going to write so hemorrhagic why hemorrhagic we already know there is a clot formation they will be friable what do i mean by friable they can be easily powdered why easily powdered or easily breakable why because look there was only thrombus it would not have been easily broken down because there, now there is a bacterial infection and also there will be inflammation happening that is why it will be friable and they can be large also why will they be large usually because bacteria keep proliferating one over each other ultimately they become large and because there is inflammation they will be damaging the valve so you can always see such thing look at on the left hand side what you are seeing here is the black arrow the big one that i have shown there is a destruction of the valve even here also and how do i identify the destruction of the valve this is your vegetation i hope all of you are able to appreciate the vegetations here and now let me look at what is happening to these vegetations if i track down this is extending along the chordate tendine so these vegetations are extending along the chordate tendine that means they have destroyed the vessel and they have extended down trickle down into the chordate tendine that is how you will identify the vegetations of infective endocarditis so just we have discussed about this just to finish off with all the vegetations and the images because they are important let me just give you all the vegetations together so that we understand we already saw this rheumatic vegetation how are rheumatic vegetation look at this these are the chordate tendine beneath and this is the valve that i'm showing here these are small warty vegetation wart like small wart like vegetations they are along the lines of closure important so they are along the lines of closure that is rheumatic infective endocarditis we just discussed they will be large usually they will be destroying the valve and extend down into the chordate tendine so large hemorrhagic destroying the valve extract uh, valve and extending down into the chordate tendine now what is nvt we we spoke about this also in nvt also there is a fibrin thrombus formed but however there is no bacterial infection no bacterial infection no inflammation no destruction of the valve so very important nvt will be along here only on the valve along the lines of the closure but however there is no destruction and these will be hemorrhagic remember 
how to differentiate NBT from the rheumatic. In rheumatic, they are wart-like, white color, because of the immune-mediated fibrosis will be happening usually there. Whereas in NBT, there is a thrombus, it should appear red. So these are hemorrhagic vegetations along the lines of closure. So two vegetations along the lines of closure, <clears throat> the NBT and the RHD. NBT will be hemorrhagic, red in color, RHD will be white in color. Even your uh, the infective endocarditis, but usually infective endocarditis will perforate or damage the valve and extend down. The last one is the Lipman Sachs endocarditis, which occurs in SLE, which is an immune complex mediated disease. And in this, you can carefully look at this. There is a vegetation. This is on the upper surface of the valve as well as the under surface of the valve. So there will be vegetations both in on both the surfaces of the valve that will be seen in Lipman Sachs endocarditis. So just these were how to know them and this was one of the question in the last year. Let me just show the other vegetation already. I've shown you two of them. Look at this. This is your NBTE. Now I hope all of you are able to appreciate these, the arrow mark that I've drawn. These are your chordae tendine. That means about this is your <clears throat> valve that is there and look carefully this, the whole band that I'm drawing, this big part that I'm drawing, this whole things are vegetations which are hemorrhagic in nature which are hemorrhagic in nature, they are not extending down into a caudate tendine, remember. So because they are not destroying, why are they not destroying? Because there is no inflammation happening there, right? So these were about the important things of the infective endocarditis and also the different vegetations. So I, I'll hand over the stage back to Dr. Irvin, sir. So uh, he will take- Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev. It was a very nice presentation to see all these pathologies of uh, infective endocarditis. And in infective endocarditis, uh, we now move on to the uh, treatment aspect of uh, uh, infective endocarditis, including the prophylaxis. So now uh, I will ask Dr. Thirud to uh, guide us about the treatment of infective endocarditis. Thank you, sir, for a good opportunity. Dr. Arvind, sir, you are leading the team very nicely, integrating medicine with the physiology, with the pathology, with the radiology, and pharmacology. It's a very, very interesting show. And my dear Damsonian, I think you're all enjoying the show. Come on, alert. Now we are going to show the wonderful session after Sanju sir's pathology, pathogenesis, my job made very, very, very simple. So how are you going to approach a case of infective endocarditis by pharmacological part? Look here, empirical regimen, that is, as sir mentioned, the common organism causing infective endocarditis are either staphylococci or streptococci or sometimes enterococcus. These are common thing. Now, if the culture reports are bending or we are waiting for the culture reports, empirically we can start some antibiotic to cover all the organism. So what are the latest guidelines is empirical therapy mean we can start giving vancomycin one gram every 12 hours intravenously plus ceftriaxone, a third generation cephalosporine, uh, 2 gram every 24 hours. So point one, my dear Damsonian, please note this point. Empirical therapy, we can give vancomycin one gram plus ceftriaxone to cover all the organism. If the report came as this cause, for example, if the infective endocarditis is due to streptococcus viridans main, that too, the culture sensitivity shows this organism susceptible for penicillin main. In this case, how we can approach for this case, if it's susceptible to penicillin main, we can go for penicillin G. 18 million unit intravenously, either continuously or four to six equal divided doses. So penicillin G. Or we can use ceftriaxone two gram intravenously once a day for four weeks. It's a common recommendation for penicillin susceptible streptococcus buildings. Suppose normally we give for four weeks. Suppose if you want to reduce the duration of therapy by two weeks mean, if you want to reduce the duration of two weeks, mean now what you should do? Combine gentamicin, add gentamicin, aminoglycoside, three milligram per kg intravenously every 24 hours, along with penicillin G or along with the ceftriaxone. This is going to reduce the duration of therapy by two weeks. That's for penicillin 
susceptible stutter cognitive breakdowns now there are some people who are unable to tolerate beta lactam antibiotic like penicillin or ceftriaxum in this case we can go for vancomycin a glycopeptide antibiotic 15 mg per kg intravenously we can give uh, 12 hourly for about 4 4 weeks that's called for penicillin allergic people who are not able to tolerate beta lactam antibiotic now sometimes the culture report shows this is infected endocarditis caused by for example streptococcus pneumonia or streptococcus biogenes group a streptococcus whereas group b c g and all unusual for this case how we going to approach for this cases we go for penicillin 18 million units intravenously either continuously or 4 to 6 equal doses or we can go for cefazolin 6 g intravenously either continuously or 3 equal divided doses or we can go for ceftriaxone 2 g intravenously for 4 weeks so duration is for 4 weeks therapy the basic is all these drugs are used and all these organisms are easily treated by beta lactam group powder most commonly we go for penicillin or ceftriaxone now for streptococcus pneumoniae for this organism better the latest guideline says better add add vancomycin and rifampicin along with the ceftriaxone ceftriaxone is the primary drug there is no doubt along with the ceftriaxone better to add vancomycin and rifampicin for a case of streptococcus pneumoniae strains if the strain is streptococcus pneumonia better add vancomycin a glycopeptide drug and rifampicin as you all know one of the very popular anti tb drug have a role here also and then how to go through enterococcal endocarditis for enterococcal endocarditis best is ampicillin 2 g intravenously every fourth month or penicillin g 18 to 30 million million units intravenously continuously or uh, six equal divided doses along with the gentamicin look here when you combine beta lactam drug with amino glycoside they exhibit synergism so for this cases we can go for penicillin g with gentamicin or ampicillin with gentamicin duration is about 4 to 6 week therapy for enterococcal resistant strain suppose the organism resistant to beta lactam drugs mean in this case what we can do we can go for vancomycin plus gentamicin if they are resistant to beta lactam antibiotic mean better go for vancomycin along with the gentamicin okay and then we also have reports methicillin induced infective endocarditis and then here sorry sorry the staphylococcus which is susceptible for methicillin methicillin is one of the group of beta lactam drug methicillin susceptible staphylococcus for this case either we can go for nafcillin or oxacillin nafcillin or oxacillin 12 g intravenously daily given either continuously or 4 to 6 divided doses or we can use cefazolin cefazolin one of the cefazolin 6 g intravenously daily given continuously or we can give three divided doses for 6 weeks therapy for methicillin susceptible staph aureus whereas very 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 important question nowadays so many organism developing resistant to methicillin especially mrsa methicillin resistant staph aureus for this case what we do is we go for vancomycin 30 mg per kg day per day intravenously divided in 2 to 3 doses very important the drug of choice for mrsa vancomycin or we can go for daptomycin daptomycin again a lipopeptide group of antibiotic useful for mrsa cases so either we can go for vancomycin or daptomycin intravenously in the dose of 8 mg per kg per day or more than this we call for mrsa methicillin resistant cases of infective endocarditis and then this one more aims question recently asked aims question 
coagulase negative staphylococci this is a common cause for prosthetic valve endocarditis for this case how to approach for this case we go for combination of vancomycin that is 30 mg per kg per day intravenously divided into 2 to 3 doses for 6 weeks therapy along with rifampicin along with rifampicin 300 mg every 8 hour for 6 weeks and also gentamicin remember a triple drug for prosthetic valve endocarditis better give vancomycin with rifampicin this is was the recently asked aims question so rifampicin is better for use for treatment of prosthetic wall endocarditis so vanco plus rifampicin with gentamicin 3 mg per kg intravenously every eighth hourly for first two weeks it is recommended for prosthetic wall okay and then there is something called head sick organism there are slow growing fastidious gram negative endococci for this cases we can go for ceftriaxone is another important third generation cephalosporin given 2 gram intravenously once daily for 4 weeks so empirical therapy is there or if the culture and sensitive report came in we can go for according to that treatment the take home message even after seeing 4 to 5 6 slides of my slide the take home message is very simple usually for infective endocarditis the better drugs are number one penicillin g number two ceftriaxone if there is not tolerable mean better go for vancomycin and along with the beta lactam drug or vancomycin better add gentamicin one of the ammonic like you say because they're going to produce synergism effect whereas if the infection with the prosthetic wall infection mean add rifampicin so vancomycin plus rifampicin with the gentamicin that is very good for prosthetic wall endocarditis darpanesis According to current medical diagnosis and treatment, latest guidelines textbook says these are the important drug therapy useful for infective endocarditis. I think I have finished my job. I am handing over to Dr. Arvind sir to proceed further. Uh, thank you Dr. Thiru for the treatment aspect of uh, infective endocarditis. Uh, so with this, we finish our three cases. Uh, if we summarize, uh, we have done the valvular heart disorders, we have done the acute rheumatic fever, and we have done the complication of uh, uh, RSD, valvular heart disease, that is infective endocarditis, three very, very important topics of medicine. Now, over to Dr. Sumir. So, you know, Dr. Arvind, you know, it has been a pleasure to hear all this, and it has been such an honor to see the, such a esteemed panel discussing everything. I think students are all enjoying it. And we have kind of gone from pathogenesis to clinical manifestations from physiology. So let us do one more case before we take a break, Dr. Arvind. All right. So uh, moving on to uh, next uh, clinical case. So I hope all the children are enjoying this session. And uh, please keep you know uh, us engaged in the chat box. We, we love seeing your chats. And we are always... I think the chat box has been the most enlightening feature of 2020 for us. We are all waiting to come live and do a, you know, on a stage class soon. Dr. Arvind, all yours. Okay, uh, next uh, clinical uh, scenario, a 50-year-old hypertensive patient with uh, poor drug compliance presented with progressively increasing dyspnea for three days. Uh, there are episodes of uh, breathlessness three to four hours uh, during the midnight and patient has to wake up from the sleep. On examination, blood pressure is 180 by 110, pulse is 120, oxygen saturation is 85%. There is presence of left ventricle S3 and lungs have bilateral crepitations. What is the clinical diagnosis? So if uh, we look at the full uh, picture of uh, uh, patient, patient is a known case of hypertension, but a poor drug compliance. Now patient has uh, symptoms of uh, uh, dyspnea and these worsening dyspnea has been there for three days. So it looks like a case of hypertension induced uh, heart failure. So most likely the clinical diagnosis is acute heart failure. Other features which are suggestive of uh, this acute heart failure are uh, the typical symptom of uh, breathlessness three to four hours uh, after patient goes to bed. That means it is a case of paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. 
so p and d so this is the symptom which is favoring the acute heart failure while patient is having a deoxygenation patient is having hypoxia as manifested by oxygen saturation of 85% so most likely this patient has developed pulmonary edema which is leading to a decrease oxygen diffusion complication of acute heart failure left sided s3 is present that means it is a left ventricle failure the, the uh, anatomy or site is left ventricle failure so this is a my clinical diagnosis that patient is a case of acute heart failure there is a left ventricle failure from lv s3 and the complication is pulmonary edema which this patient is having so what are the important question that uh, i will be uh, addressing i will be addressing the important feature what is the pathophysiology of the heart failure then after the pathophysiology we will go for the clinical feature because in the management aspect this pathophysiology we should know so that we can uh, treat the patient appropriately so now over to uh, dr sanjeev for the uh, pathophysiology of the uh, heart failure dr sanjeev thank you sir thank you dr arvind uh, yeah so i'll be taking uh, further about uh, the pathophysiology of the heart failure here so <clears throat> let me start with this you know the basic understanding of uh, heart failure heart failure simply means heart is unable to pump the blood isn't it that is what heart failure is so let us start talking about you know basically i am here talking both pathophysiology basically every time you have a problem heart tries to physiologically adapt itself so this is the normal heart so i hope all of you are able to see the red color is the chamber and the brown that i am showing is the muscle of the heart basically so now let me say this is your normal heart there can be two types of stresses on the heart happening one is okay so and i'm trying to you know correlate the microscopy as well so i'm trying to draw your uh, the uh, the microscopy or the physiological understanding of the contraction of the heart so these are your sarcomere that is i'm drawing here and now let me talk about a normal heart so i told you there will be two types of physiological stress that could be there one type of stress could be a pressure overload on the heart so whenever there is a pressure overload example for pressure overload will be a stenosis whichever is the valve like aortic stenosis can lead to pressure overload to the left ventricle and similarly the mitral stenosis can lead to for the right uh, the, the left atria etc and also the systemic hypertension especially i am talking about the pressure overload the diastolic hypertension against which the heart has to pump the blood right so this is the pressure overload so whenever there is a pressure overload heart has to pump more forcibly now so look if there is more pressure to overcome you know we were already talking this somewhere in uh, you know anupama ma'am was talking the volume uh, pressure volume curves whenever there is a pressure overload the heart has to pump more to overcome that pressure and if it has to do then it undergoes a hypertrophy we were always talking about this in general uh, general pathology so what type of hypertrophy happens so if there is a pressure overload so look what is happening to your contractile elements they undergo hypertrophy means there will be increased number of contractile elements these contractile elements which have increased are parallelly arranged they are parallelly arranged one above another this is to increase the pressure force should increase so this parallelly arranged this is what if parallelly arranged then what happen is the thickness of the muscle starts increasing and this is what we call it as so these are arranged sarcomeres are arranged parallelly and this is what we call it as a concentric hypertrophy keeps happening and possibly this patient would be having uh, if you look at x ray and other findings you will be finding this in this patient because there was a hypertensive and he was poor compliant patient as well see any hypertensive patient will start developing such type of a concentric hypertrophy that's going to happen so very important basic understanding of concentric hypertrophy of course thickness of the muscle wall is increased and that is because of increased sarcomeres of course hypertrophy means increase in sarcomere do not confuse number of cells are not increasing only the contractile elements are increasing and they are arranged in a parallel way right on the other side there could also be one more there is a volume overload that will be happening so whenever i call talk about a volume overload like a regurgitation imagine there was a aortic regurgitation what happens is again uh, you know if you remember back from your pressure volume curves that ma'am was talking at the end of the systole your aortic valve has to close now because it is regurgitated what's going to happen is you know it is going to leave some volume coming back into your 
left ventricle itself right so if that happens there will be a volume overload to the ventricle whenever there is a volume overload see first what has to heart do now whenever there is volume overload first ventricles usually are we call it compliant means they will end up what dilating for themselves to accommodate the blood so when volume overload is there the ventricle starts becoming compliant but because there is more volume your ventricle has to perform more function to pump the blood so there will be another type of hypertrophy happening here and this type of hypertrophy you now look at the sarcomeres that i'm drawing the sarcomere because of stretching of the ventricle the sarcomeres now extra sarcomeres that will be produced will be arranged in a series fashion if they are arranged in a series fashion will the number of sarcomeres be more answer is yes number of sarcomeres will be more if the number of sarcomeres are more then what will happen is there will be increase in the so look at this the thickness of the heart is not increased much in fact it has it appears it has decreased here but overall bulk of the heart has increased so this question can come in exam especially from pathological point of view which is the best indicator for hypertrophy of heart on gross examination it is not the thickness we always measure the weight of the heart why because look at the other side this the 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 other side where i am not talking that this is called as a eccentric hypertrophy in eccentric hypertrophy there is not much increase in thickness but there is increase in the volume of the chamber because of dilatation and also there will be increase in sarcomere so overall weight of the heart will increase in both of them now this is just your i am talking this is your physiological response to overloads like a pressure overload or a volume overload which will be usually one of the precipitating events for your heart failure now let us try to convert these into how they actually end up precipitating heart failure so just remember hypertrophy is not heart failure hypertrophy is a compensation by which heart wants to not go into failure basically it wants to try to pump the blood basically right so now let us talk how what is the pathogenesis this was your basic understanding of physiological compensation that is happening so now there could be two concentric uh, there could be two types of hypertrophy happening either a concentric hypertrophy is happening or there is a eccentric hypertrophy whichever it is happening depends on the cause we understood so either there is a concentric hypertrophy or there is a eccentric hypertrophy this leads to increased function of the heart so now many people have this wrong idea because in eccentric hypertrophy there is increased function of the heart yes there is increased function of the heart although there is a dilatation of the heart and that precisely that is the reason for increase in function more blood more function it has to do so right so once there is increased function now what will happen is there has to be now because the heart has increased function there will be increased demand from the heart so do not confuse this is not the peripheral demand i am talking this will be the demand from the myocardium itself because myocardium is working more it will demand more oxygen so there will be increased demand happening now let us leave this increased demand i'll try to correlate this further now whenever there is a concentric hypertrophy that is happening this will also now lead to reduction in the ventricular volume or size whatever you call it so now look you just remember that we we show i showed you that uh, image earlier in a concentric hypertrophy because the muscle becomes more thick because the muscle becomes more thick there will be some amount of compromise on the cavity of the ventricle so ventricular volume reduces because ventricular volume reduces there is only little bit of space there only that much of blood can fill so because of reduced ventricular volume or size there will be reduced filling happening so because there is a reduced filling obviously now ventricle and can only pump whatever it gets if it is getting less it will pump less so there will be a reduced cardiac output eventually happening in a concentric hypertrophy we were earlier thinking oh hypertrophy should lead to more of output that's not going to happen that's because of reduced filling this will be over span of time it will not be a sudden one day uh, uh, event that be happening on the other side let me talk about the eccentric hypertrophy so look what is happening in the eccentric hypertrophy here the eccentric hypertrophy there is no reduction in the ventricular filling remember that because there is a dilatation happening there but however very very important is in eccentric hypertrophy there will be increase in end diastolic volume of the ventricle because ventricle is unable to pump all uh, so all the blood that it is getting now this ultimately because it is unable to pump all the blood there will be increase in volume that will be there and this ultimately leads to 
<coughs> so sorry this should not be end diastolic volume it will be end systolic or the early diastolic volume so at the end of the systole uh, just make that correction at the end of the systole there is some volume left inside your ventricle so if there is some volume left inside your ventricle that means now what should happen is the start of the ventricular diastole that is after systole there should be a diastole there should be blood flowing from the atria to the ventricles that's not going to happen because already there is some amount of blood inside there and this leads to further reduced filling and reduced filling will also lead to reduced cardiac output just to make a correction here it is a misprint in it is not increased end diastolic volume it will be end systolic or we can call it early diastolic it will be early diastolic so now look further what will happen is if there is a reduced cardiac output so whole perfusion to the whole of the body will be reduced yes including more important there will be coronary insufficiency or we can say there is less perfusion to the heart also because ultimately the coronary vessels also get blood supply from the aorta and there is reduced output from the ventricle so there is a coronary insufficiency on top of this before we had studied already there was a increased demand so your heart is demanding more but you are unable to feed more to the heart this is what is further leading to the heart failure now the heart is unable to pump the blood and there is ischemia happening in the heart so this ischemia leads to reduced function of the myocardium now and that is what ultimately leads to heart is unable to pump the blood this is a very complex thing so heart failure that heart is unable to pump the blood which will further lead to reduced cardiac output which will further lead to coronary insufficiency so you get into a vicious cycle mode where there is heart is getting less blood it is able to pump less and again it gets less blood again it pumps less blood that is what is going to happen and ultimately whenever the heart failure happens either a right side or a left side based on that there will be congestion happening back and whenever there is a congestion back so left sided will manifest with the pulmonary edema the right sided will end up manifesting with the systemic edema and uh, this will be further taken uh, by <clears throat> so dr arvind further with the uh, the interpretation of uh, individual heart failure so thank you sir uh, and it, it was a good one which we understood the pathophysiology of the heart failure and uh, i request now dr arvind to take further with the clinical features of it yeah thank you dr sanjeev for this uh, pathophysiology so that we can understand the clinical features uh, easily of uh, heart failure so uh, starting with the, the uh, clinical features all right so clinical features of uh, a heart failure uh, starting with the uh, symptoms symptoms of uh, heart failure uh, if we look at most common symptom is the uh, dyspnea and the cause of uh, dyspnea is basically the pulmonary congestion pulmonary congestion and that uh, leads to complication of uh, pulmonary edema and uh, decrease oxygenation while the most specific symptom for the uh, heart failure is the paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea that means patient has to wake up two or three hours after the sleep uh, to wake up uh, while orthopnea will not be the most specific uh, symptom because there can be other causes of orthopnea like obesity uh, like uh, ascites or severe emphysema they can also lead to the orthopnea and a particular uh, pattern of the breathing where, uh, where the patient has intermittent episodes of apnea followed by hyperpnea and then apnea this is seen in almost 50% cases of uh, uh, heart failure and this symptom is usually noticed by the relatives Uh, so these are the main important symptoms which uh, uh, we should ask uh, uh, for a case of heart failure while the signs uh, signs starting with the pulse there will be pulses alternance pulses alternance means uh, there will be a regular alteration of a small amplitude pulse then high amplitude pulse then a small amplitude pulse representing the left ventricle stretching patterns in cases of chf so this is a very very specific sign of the heart failure pulses alternance and most of the students confuse it with electric alternance electric alternance is a feature of uh, the pericardial effusion that is a feature seen in ecg not in the pulse uh, we will get to see a diffuse uh, apex because uh, heart is not contracting effectively so the apex will not be localized and the area of apex will become more than 2.5 cm square 
if we get to uh, have a kusmol sign in the clinical examination so this kusmol sign is suggestive of right ventricle failure so important uh, uh, sign uh, localizing the ventricle failure to right side while s3 will be present and if s3 is present that indicate a systolic failure that is a contractile dysfunction while if s4 is present that means ventricles are stiff and it represents a diastolic failure so this will give us the some uh, pathogenesis about the heart failure or localization of the heart failure this combination of uh, uh, signs in our clinical history patient has got uh, s3 positive so that means it was a case of a uh, systolic failure now moving on to the important investigation that is the investigation x ray so i will invite dr sumer for important x ray feature and that is a uh, important question also yes uh, thank you dr arvind i think you know it, it has been such a beautiful discussion and i want to tell the students who are listening to us today that you know whatever we are able to do today is not a result of just today it is a result of you know last one month of intense discussions and debates that has happened between the faculty members and not only that it is actually a result of years and years of coordination between us so i think you know that is a result you know when you know i know uh, you know whenever i have to discuss heart failure i'll ask arvind and see what he is doing in his clinical part he will ask me what are you teaching in the radiology part and we'll end up you know asking dr sanjeev what is the pathology part and we kind of discuss it all the time even when we are having a dams informal meeting okay you will be very surprised even when we are having a informal meeting in dams we are eating a dinner together still we are always discussing medical things and i think that has you know contributed to this event and if you are really really enjoying this event do share us, do share the feedbacks on instagram social media do let us know that you are enjoying it because you know we are doing it in a digital manner normally we do it pan india in auditoriums with a massive massive energy i want you to create recreate that energy today at home hame ek corona ke negativity ko aapki energy se bhagana hai okay thank you very much so i'll i'll now quickly do the x ray part and you know uh, get get back to everything okay so now in as far as radiology of chest x ray of heart failure is concerned i will try to put everything into one slide okay so the x ray appearances of heart failure are because of increased pcwp leading to pulmonary edema okay so what will you find because of pulmonary edema the vascular pedicle will be widened you will start with redistribution of blood flow then you will go to interstitial edema that will lead to curly lines you will have a increased heart size on a chest x ray you will have a pulmonary edema alveolar edema leading to back wing appearance this is just one slide that you need to know i have already put it for you second thing i'll do is i'll put everything into one slide how heart failure progresses on a chest x ray is it starts with the stage of redistribution when the pcwp raises it starts with the stage of redistribution which leads to cardiomegaly broad vascular pedicle and a redistribution that means the upper lobe vasculature becomes dilated that is called as cephalization of blood flow then what happens is the fluid starts to leak into the interstitial fluid interstitial area and leads to interstitial edema that is where we see curly lines so you have curly b lines that you see at the lung base which are the most common horizontal lines at the lung base curly a lines that you find radiating from the hilum and curly c lines which are more theoretical which are seen as a meshwork over the entire lung field you also see things like peribronchial cuffing hazy contour of the vessels thickened interlobar fissure so thickening of the interlobar fissure is in heart failure is called as phantom tumor so you will see phantom tumor also and ultimately you will develop alveolar edema with consolidations air bronchogram bat wing appearance woolly the, the appearance will be more cottony cotton woolly and there will be pleural effusion and we always have a question on how to differentiate a cardiogenic edema from a non cardiogenic edema on x ray non cardiac edema will not have pleural effusions will not have bat wing distribution will not have curly b lines non cardiac edema would have diffuse opacification of the lung fields that you see in ards now let me show you the findings so what i think is that for your exam the most important visual is curly b lines curly b lines because sometimes they might ask you curly b lines so this is how you see the cp angle this is the normal appearance 
look at the this area you know i want you to look at the lines that i'm drawing i will remove my drawing so that you know where to look at look at this area these are these horizontal lines at the lung base these are what are called as curly v lines seen in the stage of interstitial edema in heart failure and when you have alveolar edema you have lower zone central predominant opacification that is called as bat wing appearance but look at the character of the opacity it is not very dense like you remember in respiratory session we discussed about the consolidation here this is more woolly more cottony because this is fluid this is more woolly so we say cottony woolly or we might actually say fluffy opacities in the pericardial area this is typical of heart failure but then some of you might not know how to measure the heart size on a chest x ray so we measure something called as cardiothoracic ratio we measure the maximum cardiac diameter on the right side maximum on the left side divided with the thoracic okay more than 0.5 in a adult would be cardiomegaly more than 0.6 in a infant would be cardiomegaly so in infant the heart occupies a greater percentage of the thoracic diameter so i think that is what i feel is high yield from my side on heart failure all right so after the chest x ray investigation uh, we come to the uh, management of heart failure uh, important aspects and uh, dr thiru will enlighten us about the treatment aspect and if there are any new medicines uh, in uh, pharmacology field so we get to know from sir and i see on the chat box some of the children are asking for a break break will come after dr thiru discuss the chf or drugs okay <clears throat> once again thank you sir uh i think you people have made my job very simple sir since you talk about clinical symptom and sir sanju sir talking about the pathophysiology it's very simple for me to discuss pharmacology so students one kind request this is a way you should read your textbooks also whenever you study any disease correlate from basic anatomy to up to og obstetric gynec all the things are interrelated so you must be a very good physician very good surgeon for this this education is going to be very very useful now coming to my part see the pharmacotherapy of heart failure there are two things are there drugs useful for treatment of acute congestive cardiac failure and drugs useful for chronic heart failure as sanju sir told uh, acute heart failure mean sudden onset of lv dysfunction where the sudden reduction of cardiac output so here the most important problem there be pulmonary edema because of pulmonary edema the patient is presenting with clinical symptoms of breathlessness so in acute heart failure the main management is relieving the symptoms of breathlessness so giving symptomatic therapy for that we have diuretics so lung fully loaded with the water fluid collection so to remove the fluid we need to give diuretics and then the car heart is become very stressful to relieve the work load we need vasodilators and to improve the cardiac output we need some ionotropic agents so here the drugs useful for acute heart failure I mean think of pneumonic 3 d's the 3 d's are number 1 diuretic number 2 dilator number 3 ionotropic agent here once again important mc question when you say diuretic the most important question which is the most important diuretic useful for relieving symptoms of acute heart failure it is intravenous furosemide a loop diuretic that's the most important mc question for relieving symptoms of acute heart failure the diuretic choice is intravenous furosemide and then dilator we have some vasodilator atrial dilator veno dilator coming to inotropic lot of drugs are there like digoxin dopamine dobutamine norepinephrine like that we have so many inotropic agent here suppose a patient have a heart failure with oliguria here i want to improve the cardiac output as well as i want to improve the renal outflow also for that best option we can go for dopamine and we also have one more drug norepinephrine that's also wonderful drug for treatment of acute heart failure now coming to the chronic heart failure here 
the problem is gradual reduction of left ventricular function so the gradually there's a decrease in cardiac output because the process is very slow the myocardium going for some compensation there are some compensatory changes taking place in case of chronic heart failure what are the compensation one is reactivation of catecholamine this is very important compensation yeah another very 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 important compensation taking place in chronic heart failure is activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system it is called ras pathway so activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system look here all these are coming as a compensation but on chronic compensation what happen the catecholamine activity that is acting on beta 1 receptor causes increase in heart rate increase in force of contraction and they also cause alpha activity causing vasoconstriction the sympathetic action and the renin angiotensin aldosterone they going to form angiotensin 2 formation that again going to cause severe vasoconstriction and aldosterone going to cause sodium water retention so all these thing on chronic basis going to cause stress on the myocardium stress the stress on the myocardium may cause ventricular remodeling so one of the major problem in chronic heart failure the myocardium going for remodeling so to prevent remodeling to prevent further worsening of heart failure what we should do we should block this compensatory pathway that is for controlling the catecholamine activity we have to use beta blocker and for controlling the renin angiotensin aldo system we have ras pathway blocker like ace inhibitor angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor arb aldo so receptor blocker and aldo so antagonist mra mean mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist this is called spironolactone the aldo steon antagonist all these drugs are useful for chronic heart failure here the most important question these drugs are disease modifying drug in heart failure they going to control the progression of disease here very very interesting question look here we have one drug called spironolactone that is a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist that's a potassium sparin diuretic that diuretic going to prevent remodeling that mean disease modifying diuretic so please remember doctor can you please chat with me my first question my first question come on chat i want to see in the chat box can you tell me which is the diuretic useful for rapid relief of symptom alone in this case choice is iv furosemide whereas a diuretic useful to modify disease progress mean think of spironolactone a potassium sparin diuretic so a disease modifying drugs are drugs going to reduce mortality in heart failure mean they call renin angiotensin aldosterone blocker ras pathway blockers they are the very 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 important in that the most important first class of drug for chronic heart failure either we can go for ac inhibitor and arb in this i want to ask one question can you please come on ready chat with me we have one arb plus one drug called sacubitril very important arb valsartan valsartan is arb sacubitril is a neprilysin inhibitor selective neprilysin blocker this is also useful for heart failure and the beta blocker this is again very very important question what are all the important beta blocker approved for treatment of heart failure that means you should know carvedilol the most famous beta blocker it's a beta blocker having additionally alpha blocking property carvedilol a beta blocker very fantastic drug for treatment of heart failure the other beta blocker useful for heart failure includes number 1 bisoprolol and then metoprolol succinate and one more drug nebiolol so remember doctor what are all the beta blocker approved for treatment of heart failure mean think of most important question carvedilol other beta blockers are bisoprolol metoprolol succinate and nebiolol here one very 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 interesting question beta blockers are going to cause negative inotropic effect they going to reduces the force of contraction so the ejection fraction may get decreases so remember 
whenever you want to use beta blocker in acute heart failure do echocardiogram look at the ejection fraction and one more thing you should start the beta blocker in low doses and gradually increase the dose to the optimum level and in case of grade 3 grade 4 failure they may going to further reduce the ejection fraction in the case first stabilize the patient by using diuretic therapy or ac beta therapy and then go for beta blocker okay of course although steon antagonist spinal nectum plays a major role for disease modification and some new drug we have one drug called evabradin come on evabradin actually it's a funny current sodium channel blocker this drug having two important clinical use useful for number 1 heart failure number 2 it is also useful for treatment of angina so the two fda approved indications of evabradin are one is for heart failure one more thing for angina in this i want to tell one more important point we have combination of isosorb dinitrate plus hydrolysin isosorb dinitrate we know nitrate category drug hydrolysin one of the potassium opener pure arteriolar dilator this combination also plays a major role in treatment of heart failure especially they studied the drug in african american population this has a very good role in controlling heart failure so in this slide we discussing what are all the important drug useful for chronic heart failure or disease modifying drug remember doctor for acute heart failure vein, we go for furosemide or inotropic like dopamine or dobutamine or norepinephrine or digoxin and some dilator chronic mean go for beta blocker with ras pathway blockers in that i want to revise some important newer information for you so please alert my by the students come on alert one thing look here we have something called calcium sensitizer calcium going to see you know digoxin a drug inhibiting sodium potassium atv is pump they going to accumulate calcium the calcium causes increase in force of contraction similarly we have something called calcium sensitizer like pimobendin levosimendin they also useful for heart failure and then we have one latest drug called omicamative omicamative is a direct myosin acting they going to act on cardiac myosin thereby increasing the force of cardiac contraction called omicamative newer drug and then you must know drug there is something called a uh, natriuretic peptide we have anp and bnp anp stands for atrial natriuretic peptide and bnp stands for brain natriuretic peptide natri that means sodium loss uresis mean water loss the peptides are vaso dilator here one very famous aims question need question find out which one of the following is the synthetic bnp analog the drug name is neseritide very important neseritide a brain natriuretic peptide analog having vaso dilatory reaction and natriuresis action diuretic action useful for heart failure but given only intravenous never oral it's a peptide never oral only intravenous and this drug causing severe hypotension problem and once again doctor you must know question natriuretic peptides are undergo rapid metabolism by an enzyme called neprilysin it's also called neutral endopeptidase so neprilysin is also called neutral endopeptidase here you must know question there are two to three times the question came in aims paper find out the selective neprilysin inhibitor they call sacubitril and ecdotril come on the two important newer drug comes under neprilysin inhibitor I mean think of ecdotril and sacubitril in this i want to revise one more thing there are some drug for example we have something called omepatrilat and sampatrilat look here omepatrilat sampatrilat these drugs are having two action what two action they going to inhibit one inhibiting neprilysin enzyme as well as they going to inhibit angiotensin converting enzyme look here omepatrilat sampatrilat are 
dual dual enzyme in the bidam what are the two enzymes they going to block one is neprilysin enzyme one more thing angiotensin converting enzyme now the interesting question since omoplatelet sampatelet inhibiting angiotensin converting enzyme they also accumulate bradycardine resulting in cough look you know ace inhibitor name and all ending with the pril capta pril listen up pril but you should know even omoplatelet sampatelet also having angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitory property this point you should know so what i discussed so far for treating heart failure divide the portion two thing acute heart failure chronic heart failure acute mean three d's dilator diuretic furosemide and inotropic like dopamine dobutamine digoxin chronic mean go for beta blocker plus renin angiotensin aldo stone system blocker and i also show some newer drug useful for congestive cardiac failure i think i completed all the important drugs useful for heart failure now i am uh, handing over to dr arvind sir to proceed further uh, thank you dr thiru for presenting this uh, beautiful uh, world of pharmacology so it was a very good presentation so we are now done with the uh, heart failure as a clinical case we have done the pathophysiology clinical features we have seen the chest x ray we have done the management aspect now over to dr sumer okay so dr sanjeev you are now in your dj mood i can see from your background is dr sanjeev is now our dj and i request dr thiru also like you know we always have a song sometimes whenever we are going for a break so uh, sometimes we have a hindi song punjabi song but today i want to ask dr thiru if he can help us with his phone and on his phone if we can play on good volume some super hit tamil song that is <laughs> going on right now bas <laughs> and the you know i i know dr thiru is a big rajini fan so dr thiru <laughs> sir suddenly you ask we go hot songs a lot of songs are there sir in the fun of a live session everything happens in like this only students are already writing in the chat box yes sir <laughs> and Dr. Sanjeev also is uh, some Kannada song or something. Sir, I am picking a song uh, which was uh, lyrics by one of our student, uh, Dr. V R Joshi, and uh, you know uh, it is a remix, Kannada remix of a very uh, well-known English song. You know, let's uh, beat to the music. thiru we are waiting for the entry of the grand song sir <laughs> rajini song just one second sir one second sir so by we will take some suggestions from students also students tell us any song that you think would recharge your batteries do let us know Thank <laughs> you. 
wants to see Arvind sir's moves. <laughs> Thank you, Guru and students. If you are enjoying it, if you are dancing to any of the songs, do share your pictures with us on the Instagram or on Facebook Club. We are looking forward to you know be a part of our event. You know because we are doing it virtually, but we feel connected to you, and I know you feel connected to us. I want to you know build that connect further, and we all you know I, I want you to know we are all you know all the teachers this year have gone the extra mile. They have actually done if they would have done hundred percent for you. Which they always do in dance. This year they have done 200 percent, 300 percent. Everybody has tried their best to make sure that continuity of your education continues. So please be back after a break. Thank you very much. <laughs>